All glory to our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. He's the author and finisher of our faith, and without him, nothing is possible. Okay, as I promised, I'm going to break down the treasonous acts of Presidents Woodrow Wilson and Theodore Roosevelt, also Senator Nelson Aldrich, who played a major role in the establishment of the Federal Reserve Act of 1914. The mysterious, corrupt, yet illustrious careers of these three men is why I strongly emphasize there is a substantial difference between a president and a king. The way that things have morphed into the way they are now, and we have this system of so-called checks and balances between the three branches of government, the executive, the judicial, and the congressional or legislative, the way that things are now is a curse upon the nations to give you corruption. Okay, there's I don't have time to go into the five major curses. You have to see my other vi videos for that. But the curse upon the nation is one of the five major curses because of the disobedience of men in adhering to the teachings of the serpent, which have led to lesbian, gay rights, abortion, and all of these senseless plagues, these, these pandemics or plandemics, as they call them. The scriptures direct us to kings in the Old Testament and the King of Kings, Lord of Lords, who is to come in Christ Jesus. And he is the only king we are to put our trust in because he is uncorruptible and cannot fail. But in this dispensation, power corrupts, flesh corrupts furthermore. In 2 Samuel chapter 24, I've mentioned this in the last video, King David transgressed the commandment of the Lord in conducting a census of the men and women of Israel and Judah. The Most High gave him grace to choose how he should be afflicted, how the Most High should deal with him for his disobedience. He gave him the choice of famine amongst Israel for a period of time, a plague to strike the nation of Israel, or King David's own life to be threatened by his enemies. Now, King David was a man of war. He survived the Philistines, the Edomites. He even survived the counsel of his own son. And to a degree, he may have been endangered by the commander of his army, Joab, who was the, the son of Zariah, he and his brothers, who murdered the king's sons, Absalom. Yet he, even King David, who was considered a righteous king, the apple of God's eye, he chose his interest over the interest of the people, which led to 70,000 people dying of a plague. He surely would not have survived as a politician a day with that type of resume, but he was king in the military, the economy, the laws of the land were all at his command. The prophets Gad and Nathaniel were to David what, what Samuel was to King Saul. They were messengers of the Lord sent to give the king the unadulterated word of the Lord. That was government in the Old Testament. Such is not the case with one who presides in the president. Nevertheless, let's go back to the year 1913. Senator Nelson Aldrich was majority leader of the Senate and the newly appointed head of the National Monetary Commission after the masses stressed concerns about central banks and the stigma attached to them being financial entities that induced money panics in the past. Up to that time, the USA and Western nations experienced the Panic of 1873 
which led to the, the demonetization of silver as a tradable currency. The panic of 1893 derived simply from speculations that the failure of wheat crop growth in Argentina might spread, which was public witchcraft manipulated by European bankers. And of course, the panic of 1907 was caused by the same European perpetrators. The worst among the three, banks lost their solvency. The New York Stock Exchange significantly declined and customers saw the liquidity of their bank accounts regress, which of course permitted the synagogues to concentrate their sorceries on enacting the Federal Reserve of 1914. Senator Aldrich perceived oversight via the National Monetary Commission was to offset the concerns and insecurities of the voting public, of whom most had recently survived three nationwide financial panics and vastly despised central banks. Near the early to mid-1800s, the USA, having already established the U.S. Treasury, the U.S. government empowered an independent treasury system, which led to the creation of the first bank of the USA. Following its conception, the nation witnessed inflation, record highs of unemployment, overtaxation on tariffs, and a massive downturn on liquidity in the markets, which were the same crises experienced in the U.S. prior to the creation of the independent treasury system. President Martin Van Buren succumbed to the pressure of state banks and their lack of hard currency reserves. But the synagogues had plants in the Van Buren administration to covertly ignite speculation to inflate the prices of wheat, corn, barley, and other consumer goods, so that the shortage in gold, silver, and other hard currencies would quickly spread, encouraging a segue for big banks to rescue economies with printable currency so they could cripple infrastructure which at that time was farming and agriculture. So before there could be a Federal Reserve Bank, the synagogues and treasonous politicians had to tiptoe to totalitarianism. My favorite book that explains how the U.S. currency system was hijacked by Marxist communist factions is one written by the late Eustace Mullins. It's called The Secrets of the Federal Reserve. It says, uh, page 18, starting page 18, the monetary reform plan prepared at Jackal Island was to be presented to Congress as the completed work of the National Monetary Commission. It was imperative that the real authors of the, of the bill remain hidden. So great, so great was popular resentment against bankers since the Panic of 1907 that no congressman would dare to vote for a bill bearing the Wall Street taint, no matter who had contributed to his campaign expenses. The Jekyll Island plan was a central bank plan, and in this country, there was a long tradition of struggle against inflicting a central bank on the American people. It had begun with Thomas Jefferson's against Alexander Hamilton's scheme for the first bank of the United States, backed by James Rothschild. It had continued with President Andrew Jackson's successful war against Alexander Hamilton's scheme for the second bank of the United States, in which Nicholas Biddle was acting as the agent for James Rothschild of Paris. The result of that struggle 
was the creation of the independent sub-treasury system, which supposedly had served to keep the funds of the United States out of the hands of the financiers. A study of the panics of 1873, 1893, and 1907 indicates that these panics were the result of the international bankers operations in London. Why is this important? Because the, these people were not under the sovereignty, their leadership was not under the sovereignty of the United States. These were European bankers. They just were printing money out of thin air, then coming to the United States to make them subject to their lending process which the United States currently resides under. The United States borrows money from an entity that's not a part of the United States, yet they're incorporated. Their, their members are incorporated in the process of distributing money to the United States Treasury, but they're private stakeholders. That's unconstitutional. Anyway, continuing on in this paragraph, it says the public was demanding in 1908 that Congress enact legislation to prevent the reoccurrence of art artificially induced money panics just by hearsay, just people speculating. Then, I mean, basically, that's public witchcraft so that people will see and have fear of an issue that really doesn't currently exist. They create chaos, order out of chaos. Going on, it says, such monetary reform now seemed inevitable. It was to head off and control such reform that the National Monetary Commission had been set up with Nelson Aldrich as its head since he was majority leader of the Senate. The main problem, as Paul War Warburg informed his colleagues, was to avoid the name Central Bank. For that reason, he had decided upon the designation of Federal Reserve System, this would deceive the people into thinking it was not a central bank. Like they use Biden and Trump to deceive people into thinking they're opposites, yet they're both the same, working for the same employer. Red and blue, both working for the same hidden demonic member of the synagogues. Continuing, it says, however, the Jekyll Island plan would be a central bank plan fulfilling the main functions of a central bank, it would be owned by private individuals who would profit from ownership of shares. As a bank of issue, it would control the nation's money and credit, which is really supposed to be given to Congress. Congress is supposed to have the power to coin money. But this is telling us that this is an ind independent entity that's controlling the United States money and credit. Uh, going down, it says in the chapter on Jekyll Island in his biography of Aldrich, S Stevenson writes of the conference was to be represented in the board of directors. It was to have full knowledge of all banks affairs but a majority of the directors were to be chosen directly or indirectly by the banks of the association. Thus, the proposed Federal Reserve Bank was to be controlled by Congress and answerable to the government. But the majority of the directors were to be trolls chosen directly or indirectly by the banks of the association. In the final refinement of Warburg's plan, the Federal Reserve Board of Governors would be appointed by the President of the United States. But the real work of the board would be controlled by a Federal 
a federal advisory council meeting with the governors. The council would be chosen by the directors of the 12 Federal Reserve Banks and would remain unknown to the public. The next consideration was to conceal the fact that the Federal Reserve System would be dominated by the masters of the New York money market. New York is the merchant state. The congressmen from the South and the West could not survive if they voted for a Wall Street plan. Farmers and small businessmen in those areas had suffered most from the money part panics. These are the so-called white settlers. They had most of the farms and, 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 and agriculture businesses in those days. There had been great popular resentment against the Eastern banker, bankers, which during the 19th century became a political movement known as populism. The private papers of Nicholas Biddle, not released until more than a century after his death, show that quite nearly, quite early on the Eastern bankers were fully aware of the widespread public opposition to them. Paul Warburg advanced at Jekyll Island a pri primary deception which would present, prevent the citizens from recognizing that his plan set up a central bank. This was the regional reserve system. He pr proposed a system of four, later 12, branch reserve banks located in different sections of the country. Few people outside the banking world would realize that the existing concentration of the, the nation's money and credit structure in New York made the, re the proposal of a regional reserve system a delusion. Now I'm reading from this manuscript to unveil to you the power dynamics of this current regime which is the U.S. Corporation, formerly known as the U.S. of A. It's no longer the USA because Congress afforded its right to coin money. According to Article 1, Section 8 of the Constitution, once the money supply was in control of foreign private stakeholders, the previous government or a few congressional participants, they committed treason by handing over the sovereignty of the U.S. to communists, who privately were the synagogues of Satan and still are to this day. Paul Warburg, he was a European banker. Nicholas Biddle, he was European, and they sent him as an agent on behalf of the banks they had already established in Europe. These people were already enslaved in Germany, Russia, all these different uh, uh, countries and continents. They were enslaving them in debt to the European bankers. From that point, the U.S. of A was not a democracy. By the way, God never desired, as I mentioned earlier, for people to abide under democratic rule. The founding fathers of what used to be the USA, they were deists. They, and publicly, they desired to govern according to the voice of the serpent. And privately, many of the bigwigs were cannibalists, and they were sadistically perverse. Prior to his cast out of heaven, Lucifer perceived God as a dictator or a threat to his ambitions to become God. So the incumbents and constituents who influenced this, this Babylonian society adhere to the teachings of the serpent, which is Crowleyism, or do what thou wilt. But sequentially, this USA corporation always create its own boogeyman to wage war against. 
and such boogeyman is marked as a dictator. In the early 90s to early 2010s, we witnessed the regimes of Saddam Hussein, Osama bin Laden, Muammar Gaddafi. They were all publicly marked as dictators or terrorists. Once they were removed, Obama included everybody, notably the LGBTQ. Then they switched it up with Trump to play the role of a toxic agent of chaos. He even went as far as befriending communist dictator Kim Jong-un and allegedly inciting a coup of the U.S. presidency. Again, this was all a script, all a role given to Trump. Because Trump was characterized as the new boogeyman because war in the Middle East would not complement their efforts in seizing the civil liberties of the masses in particular white people, and therefore inching a step further to issuing the mark of the beast and incorporating the later stages of the new world order. The hostility in the Middle East during the 90s and early to mid-2000s was for the sake of establishing the Homeland Security Act to put everyone under surveillance. So we went from that to Facial recognition, even on some video games. I mean, the Patriot Act, through the establishment of Homeland Security, that was only the beginning stages. Not to mention all the other ways technology has been used to infringe upon our freedoms and privacy. Rewind back through history and see the dictates by instituted apparatuses of today and see how they cease to exist without the establishment of the Federal Reserve. God never desired for man to have democracy because man is inherently evil. The collective voice or voices of the masses does not illustrate righteousness. Man's life is, is just a vapor, yet he drinks iniquity like water, as the scriptures say. As I said before, the scriptures describe democracy without mentioning the word democracy. When God scattered the languages during the Tower of Babel, men on the earth collectively agreed to attempt a coup against the Most High. When Christ was due for crucifixion, the masses chose Barabbas, who was a murderer. They chose him to be freed instead of an innocent man. Israel rejected the Most High and chose King Saul. But nevertheless, although God never desired for man to be governed by democracy, the U.S. technically has never been a democracy. The founding fathers made a secret pact with Lucifer to capitalize off the ownership of slaves because they knew who the true Hebrews are. But as I've said many times before, the devil doesn't get screwed on the deals he makes with men. Many of even the founding fathers, they died not knowing the plot to compromise the sovereignty of the U.S. They didn't even know that that was in the works. The Rothschilds, for the last 400 years, they've had agents who've clandestinely operated in foreign lands on their behalf to collapse economies whilst enhancing the reach and wealth of their banks. But let's see Let's see how all of this relates to the presidency. Okay, again, I'm reading from Eustace Mullins' book, The Secrets of the Federal Reserve, Chapter 36. It's in PDF form. It says uh, at the top of page 36, the presidential campaign of 1912 records one of the most interesting political upsets in American history. 
The incumbent, William Howard Taft, was a popular president, and the Republicans, in a period of general prosperity, were firm, firmly in control of the government through a Republican majority in both houses. The Democratic challenger, Woodrow Wilson, governor of New Jersey, had no national recognition and was a stiff, austere man who excited little public support. Both parties included a monetary reform bill in their platforms. The Republicans were committed to the Aldrich plan, which had been denounced as a Wall Street plan, and the Democrats had the Federal Reserve Act. See how they split them both to deceive the masses? Both the Federal Reserve Act and the Aldrich Bill were the same thing, but they made it appear as they were different. Neither party bothered to inform the public that the bills were almost identical, except for the names. In retrospect, it seems obvious that the money creators decided to dump Taft and go with Wilson. How do we know this? Taft seemed certain of re-election, and Wilson would return to obscurity. But suddenly, Theodore Roosevelt threw his hat into the ring. Now, Roosevelt had been president before. It says he announced that he was running as a third-party candidate, the quote-unquote bull moose. His candidacy would have been ludicrous had it not been for the fact that he was exceptionally well-financed. I wonder about who. Moreover, he was given unlimited press coverage, more than Taft and Wilson combined. As a Republican ex-president, it was obvious that Roosevelt would cut deeply into Taft's vote. This proved the case, and Wilson won the election. To this day, no one can say what Theodore Roosevelt's pr program was or why he would sabotage his own party since the bankers were financing all three candidates. They would win regardless of the outcome. Later, congressional testimony showed that in the firm of Kuhn Loeb Company, whom the Warburgs married into their family, Felix Warburg was supporting Taft. Paul Warburg the brother of Felix Warburg and Jacob Schiff were supporting Wilson and Otto Kahn was supporting Roosevelt. The result was that a Democratic Congress and a Democratic president were elected in 1912 to get the central bank legislation passed. It seemed probable that the identification of the Aldrich plan as a Wall Street operation predicted that it would have a difficult passage through Congress as the Democrats would solid, solidly oppose it. Now, later they would ask Paul, Paul Warburg why did he and his brother vote for uh, different candidates? Why did they support different candidates? And he, you know, he just toyed with the media saying, Family has nothing to do with politics, something of that sort. We both independently choose who we're going to put our money behind. Yet, wars are being started based off of the money that they're putting behind these candidates, not only in the U.S., but also in Germany. They supported, they supported Hitler as well. I don't have time to go into that. So, Senator Aldrich and Teddy Roosevelt were two agents of the Rothschilds, and they infiltrated public office to sabotage the credit of the United States. Senator Aldrich was well aware that the Aldrich plan and the Federal Reserve Act was the same plan on behalf of the Rothschilds. He, he went to Jekyll Island with James War, uh, Paul Warburg, 
and also J.P. Morgan, like all of these men, uh, Benjamin, Benjamin Strong also, he was the agent of the Bank of England. All of these men went far off into Jekyll Island, deep into the woods in a cabin where the media couldn't access them, ask them what was going on. But they were still appearing in hearings, passionately debating their proposals. Like uh, Senator Aldridge would act as if he's he has doubts about the Federal Reserve Act and he he's in support of the Aldridge plan. And he would just articulate himself and just giving them a bunch of rhetoric that would distract the people from actually noticing that the Aldrich Plan and the Federal Reserve Act was to bring the United States into subjection to foreign bankers who, who had a private interest. They, they were not United States citizens, yet they had the most power to yield on the future and credit of the United States. Like, this is absurd. This is completely absurd. This is a prime example of the, the great lengths that those who hold public office and their foreign conspirators, the length that they go to to deceive the masses. Like I said, it's no different with Trump and Biden. When I read this, it, it reminded me of the heated debates and exchanges of personal attacks between Trump and Biden, yet both of them support the vaccine to be issued by the military. When it, it, it has been documented that it takes at least, at least a decade to produce a vaccine. You would think the mainstream media would attack the vaccine with the same ferocity that they've attacked Trump. They're asking you to put an unknown, unproven substance into your bodies. Today, I read that Kareem Abdul-Jabbar came out saying that he took the vaccine, so it's safe for you to take it. Listen, do, do not take the vaccine. If he wants to die, if he wants to subject himself to demons to possess his soul, let him do so. He thinks just because he's a celebrity that he can come out and maybe some dumb people will, will look a man, Kareem, he used to do the sky hook. You know, people, people do stupid stuff like that just simply because of somebody's mystique, because of their prestige. They're, they're a public figure who happens to be popular or you were entertained by them, therefore... When they talk about race or what you should put in your body, you should listen to them. Don't take the vaccine. They're working hard to get everyone to take the vaccine. It's a part of the Trump trial. And you're going to start to see more and more celebrities publicly claiming support for the vaccine. The scriptures describe these evil doers as inventors of evil things. In Romans chapter 1, verse 26, I believe. Step one was to introduce Trump in 2016 as a political provocative uh, agent of chaos in 2016. Step two was to create a pandemic in COVID-19. The same way they created the panic of 1837, 1873, 1893, 1907, the Great Depression of the 1920s, and September 11. Uh, step three was to introduce the vaccine as a solution. Remember, problem, reaction, solution. Step four was to use both candidates to support the vaccine and martial law. Step five was to use public witchcraft through mainstream media to illustrate the scarcity of the vaccine. That's mass manipulation that make the vaccine seem so scarce that people are forming long lines 
waiting because they're concerned about getting them and their children vaccinated. They, they, this is truly satanic. They, they're they using so much sorcery through, through this television and the mobile devices. Step six, demonize Trump and stage the riots at Capitol Hill near the end of Trump's presidency. Mind you, the U.S. Attorney General, when he made his announcement, he kept calling the rioters actors. Remember, Trump had a press conference where they, they kept saying, you know, we running a live exercise. Step seven, have celebrities take the vaccine to convince you to take it. Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, Hank Aaron, and they, they choose those two on purpose because they're, they're elderly guys that are closer to death. And, you know, older people look more serious. Like, they do these things. I'm telling you, it's public witchcraft. Step eight, vaccinate at least a quarter of the populace before making the vaccine mandatory. And I wouldn't be surprised if they... You know, they see that the numbers are low. People haven't been getting out to take the vaccine, that they start incorporating some type of tax incentive or some type of monetary benefit so that people can get out to go and take the vaccine. You you got to use discernment and identify who is behind the, cu the curtain and why they are using the Trump trap to get people, to get the souls of men and to, to, to really carry out this population control strategy that they've been planning for so many decades. People have no idea how long these people have been planning this. Now, history claims many societies who were destroyed for their wickedness of inventing evil things exploiting the poor, and so forth. One of those societies was Sodom and Gomorrah. And Matthew 12, verse 43 says, when an evil spirit goes out of a man and walks through dry places, seeking rest, finds none, then it goes and says, I'll return back to the house from which I was cast out. Then it takes several spirits more wicked than itself and the last state of that man is worse than the beginning. But remember, Christ said, so shall it be with this wicked generation. So a whole generation may be plagued with a new cast of demons for the iniquities committed by the previous generation. The 1970s, that introduced heroin as a nationwide drug, drug epidemic. Then you had the 1980s, which brought crack cocaine. The 1960s introduced feminism. Then 50 years later, we had transgenders who have their rights. In the 1960s, they would have never, never went for that. Some time ago, I did a video titled Billions of Demons on the Earth. And the, the witness of the Holy Spirit revealed this to me. Things are not the way they used to be. The way our society operates today is in its infancy state compared to the generations that preceded the 20th and 21st centuries, which no longer thrives off farming and agriculture. But the discernment of many have been sucked dry by technology, which the fallen angels, they use men to create. So things today are not as they appear to be because they're using technology to blind people. Now, most are familiar with Abraham, who God blessed to be the father of many nations. One of the reasons God did so is because Abraham is from the lineage of Enoch, who God took up after he walked with God for 300 plus years. Now, Enoch was once king over all men of the earth. The book of Jasher, chapter 3, verse 5 through 12, 
it says, And Enoch rose up according to the word of the Lord and went forth from his house, from his place, and from the chamber, and waited. And he went to the sons of men and taught them the ways of the Lord. And at that time assembled the sons of men and acquainted them with the instruction of the Lord. And he ordered it to be proclaimed in all places where the Son of Man dwelt, saying, Where is the man who wishes to know the ways of the Lord and good works? Let him come to Enoch. And all the sons of men then assembled themselves to him. For all who desired this thing went to Enoch. And Enoch reigned over the sons of men according to the word of the Lord, and they came and bowed to him, and they heard his word. And the Spirit of God was upon Enoch, and he taught all men, all his men the wisdom of God and his ways, and the sons of men served the Lord all the days of Enoch, and they came to hear his wisdom. And all the kings of the sons of men both first and last, together with their princes and judges, came to Enoch when they heard of his wisdom. And they bowed down to him, and they also required of Enoch to reign over them, to which he consented. And they assembled in all 130 kings and princes, Remember, God is not the author of confusion, but of peace. Look at this. These, these are all kings and princes coming into agreement. There is an old threat of the government shutdown. Wherever, wherever God is, it's his will, there's going to be peace. That's why in heaven, people are going to have crowns. So many millions and billions of people will have, have crowns, yet there will be peace. No one trying to overthrow the other. And all these kings and princes, they made King Enoch king over them. And they were all under his power and command. And Enoch taught them wisdom, knowledge, and the ways of the Lord. And he made peace amongst them. And peace was throughout the earth during the life of Enoch. And Enoch reigned over the sons of men 243 years. And he did justice and righteousness with all his people, and he led them in the ways of the Lord. So again, I mentioned this in previous videos, that Christ is the greater Enoch. But they don't put the book of Enoch in their original Manuscript of, the, uh, uh, manuscript of the King James Version. When Christ comes, he's going to reign for a thousand years in New Jerusalem. Okay. So all the earth was righteous during the days of Enoch. Even after the fallen angels corrupted the DNA of men, from Enoch to the birth of Noah was 152 years according to the book of Jasher, which tells us the birth of Noah, if you do the calculation of the, the age of Enoch and Lamech and, and, and Noah, uh, after the birth of Noah, you'll see, according to Jasher chapter 4, that was 152 years to the birth of Noah. And we know during the days of Noah was the flood where men were, their thought, the thoughts of men were evil continually. So remember, Christ said when an evil spirit is cast out, that generation, that spirit comes back not only with that person, but also with an entire generation. And the last state of that person and the generation is worse than in the beginning. So I believe this was around the time animals began to bite men and be hostile towards them, talking about after the days of Noah. Because the fallen angels corrupted humans. 
That's why Noah had to use the discernment in bringing animals onto the ark. And even animals today are corrupted by the fallen angels. From Enoch to the days of Noah, that, that time of the flood is 400 years. So that was 400 years where the fallen angels through coming into the daughters of men and teaching them a lot of the sorceries, the mixing of DNA and the, the wearing of makeup through the eyes and just teaching them all sorts of wickedness. During that 400 span, it took, that's just how short a time it took for the whole earth to go from being righteous to being as wicked as it has ever been to this day. Remember, Christ said, it went, went right before he come back, there will be no greater tribulation since the days of Noah. So when Lamech first saw his son Noah, he was afraid because Noah looked like the, the, the fallen angels. He didn't look human. So Enoch said, listen, this is the curse upon all the bloodlines of the earth because of what the fallen angels did. And you can go back and read this and I believe it's Enoch chapter 106, verse 10 through 15. So Enoch had to explain to Lamech because Lamech's faith wasn't as strong. He had to explain to Lamech, listen, and our bloodline has some of this fallen angel seed. Then I believe that's what steered also the whole earth to becoming righteous because Enoch saw these angels. You know, he was real close to God and he saw the torment that came upon these angels who foolishly chose to come out of their first estate, as the scripture tells us, to go into the daughters of men. So this is why we got to live righteous. And during those days when men were born, they, like I said, they grew immediately into their physical peak because God had yet to scatter the languages of the earth which happened in the Tower of Babel. It's where the word baby comes from. Although Babel means confusion, that, that, that stems, that's the root of men having to come when men are born into the earth. God made it so not only did he scatter the languages, but man now would have to be, they would have to grow up from infancy stage and be taught righteousness. No longer were the days when God created Adam, he created him a man. He didn't create him a boy first. Then when Eve had her first conception of birth, she said, I've acquired a man from the Lord. You see that? But once God made Abraham the father of many nations, he made a covenant with Abraham and his lineage to be Hebrews. But that would have to, but they would have to live a certain way to offset that tainted DNA. That's where the law of Moses came in. See, the children of Israel, they needed 600 plus laws to ward off the penalty of, by that tainted blood. The bloodlines were corrupted twice, at least twice. But more likely, it was far more than twice. Because again, you see Goliath in the book of 1 Samuel. And that was many generations after Noah. The serpent, as I've said in previous videos, he had sex with Eve. Just like the fallen angels came into the daughters of men. And later in the scriptures, like I said, we hear about Goliath. He was half human. That and wasn't a normal man was not nine feet tall. And also the scripture tells us about King Og, O-G, it's spelled O-G. He was an Amorite. King Og, he was an Amorite. And they mentioned him in the book of Deuteronomy. He was so, so tall, so big that they had to literally measure a bed for him. He, he was a giant. He wasn't human. 
So men on the earth, they learned all their wickedness from the fallen angels. A lot of the weapons that we use to defend ourselves, that, that comes from the teaching of the fallen angels. Men would, but men would need to fight if he had never ate from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Adam and Eve, they didn't even know that they were naked, let alone, you know, fighting and having to cover themselves. All of this came from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Now, of course, we we utilize pen and paper to bind agreements, contractual obligations that's in this society. Even the word of God was manifested through writing utensils. But let me read from the book of Enoch again, chapter 8. It says in Enoch chapter 8, And Azazel taught men to make swords and knives and shields and breastplates and made known to them the metals of the earth and the art of working them and bracelets and ornaments and the use of antimony and the beautifying of the eyelids and all kinds of costly stones and all coloring tinctures. And there arose much godlessness and they committed fornication and they were led astray and became corrupt in all their ways. Simjaza taught enchantments and root cuttings. Armaros the resolving of enchantments. Barakwajo taught astrology. See, that's all of that, you know, what sign are you? All of that is demonic. Kokobo, the constellations. Ezekiel, the knowledge of the, the clouds. See, they taught, they taught men how to predict the weather also. Sham, Shamsael, the signs of the sun, and Sarael, the course of the moon. And as men perished, they cried, and their cry went up to heaven. By the way, also root cuttings, they taught root cuttings so that men can learn how to artificially grow food, like how everything now is genetically modified and they have fields of genetically modified crops the, the demons those fallen angels wanted to eliminate the natural growth of food to, to alter the minds of men so they taught them root cuttings that's where, where root cuttings come from through plants and stuff now let's go to Enoch chapter 69 it says, and after this judgment, they shall terrify and make them to tremble because they have shown this to those who dwell on the earth. And behold, the names of those angels, and these are their names. The first of them is, again, Samjaza. The second are Taquifa. And the third are men. The fourth, Kokobo. The fifth, Turael. And they just go on and list the angels. Now skip down to verse 3. It says, And these are the chiefs of their angels and their and their names and their chief ones over a hun over hundreds and over fifties and over tens. Then it goes on to list the names again. It says, And the second was Asbiel, verse 5. He imparted to the holy sons of God evil counsel and led them astray so that they defiled their bodies with the daughters of men. Uh, verse 4, the list Jaquan, and this is the one who led astray all the sons of God and brought them down to the earth and led them astray through the daughters of men. Verse 6, and the third was named Gadriel. He, it, he, it, it is who showed the children of men all the blows of death. And, and he led astray Eve and showed the weapons 
of death to the sons of men, the shield and the coat, the coat of mail, and the sword for battle, and all the weapons of death to the children of men. So this is how we know in the Garden of Eden, Eve will show more than just a fruit on the tree. That there was so much more deepness to that tree of knowledge of good and evil that I don't have time to get into, maybe at a later date. But if we go down to verse 7, it says, And from his hand they have proceeded against those who dwell on the earth from that day and forevermore. And the fourth was named Penemuel. He taught the children of men the bitter and the sweet, and he taught them all the secrets of their their wisdom. The, the bitter and the sweet is in reference to like alcohol men would get drunk on the earth. Verse 9, And he instructed mankind in writing with ink and paper, and thereby many sinned from eternity to eternity and until this day. Verse 10, For men were not created for such a purpose to give confirmation to their good faith with pen and ink. For men were created exactly like the angels to the intent that they should continue pure and righteous and death, which destroys everything, could not have taken hold of them. But through this knowledge, they are perishing. And through this power, it is consuming. So something as simple as ink and paper was not even the will of God. And I have to go deep. But let me wrap up. It, 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 see, with pen and paper, pen and ink, that's how you get the Federal Reserve. If, if they, men start writing things on paper, then mailing it out to the people. People learn the laws of the land through, especially before television. You know, men would write things on using ink, pen and ink and paper to write their laws, to, to write deeds, which is really their word of mouth, which man will never keep. That's why God say he don't want men involved in that. That's how you get this court, the court systems, everything through ink and paper. Then later, the, the fallen angels taught men how to make everything run digitally, you know, which is a whole nother teaching. So man's confirmation would have come from God himself through revelation from his spirit so that when man, the closer man gets to God, he doesn't need confirmation from his, his fellow men. But now man needs documentation as proof that they've wrote the Constitution and they don't even abide by half of what is written. Even the Holy Scriptures has been compromised through the lives of men. So many different observations, perspectives among men, certain sectors and institutions in this fallen world. This Babylonian society is just a mess. And, and sports is a recreation invented by the synagogues who rely on the occult through fortune telling, soothsaying, and necromancy. You know, to, to formulate, of course, with the help of demon spirits. Many of the endeavors accessible to the masses in the form of television and social media and everything else entertainment wise. So God said because they exploited the minds of men to their own demise, there awaits them eternal torment in the lake of fire through something so minute as ink and pen and court systems and governments and militaries have reigned in injustice throughout the earth's history because of these fallen angels. So through the unscrupulous court systems of these United States, someone is always in prison without merit. A prosecutor or a judge may intercede on the behalf of a wicked person at the expense of the righteous. 
and YouTube is one great example. They've established an algorithm and corporate host of individuals that intercedes on behalf of the wicked every day. But who will intercede on their behalf and who will be the intercessor of the wicked when they stand before a holy God on Judgment Day? I mean, the satanic court systems of America mandate everything in favor of the woman. And I know it's a demon behind it. And I'll address that in another video in the future. But I just wanted to illustrate the wrath of God. And this is why women need to refute and renounce the modern day indoctrination of this Babylonian society and its sorceries that are geared towards the woman. As I said before, God is just. Even when he casts a pregnant woman who's unrepentant of her sins, if he casts her into hell and takes her unborn baby to heaven with him, he'll still be just. Enoch chapter 62, starting at verse 2, it says, And the Lord of spirits seated him on the throne of his glory. And the spirit of righteousness was poured out upon him. And the word of his mouth slay all sinners. And all the unrighteous are destroyed from before his face. And there shall stand up in that day all the kings and the mighty. And the exalted and those who hold the earth. And they shall see and recognize how he sits on the throne of his glory and righteousness is judged before him. And check this out. And no lying word is spoken before him. No lying word. So you, you can't you can't lie before the throne of God. Even Satan cannot lie in God's presence. Those who stand before him on judgment day. They're going to tell on themselves. That's the purpose of this meat suit. The, the flesh records everything you do. And when your spirit and soul is re re released into that next realm, the flesh, the recordings of the flesh is left. Of course, the flesh itself goes underneath the ground, but the recordings of the flesh is spiritual. That's where dreams come from. All that stuff is documented. So when the people who plan COVID and all these atrocities, the murdering of innocent children and, and, and all of the satanic wicked things they've done, all the abominations this society has inherited, when they stand before God, he's going to ask them, what did you do? And that won't be, you know, like how people are able to lie now. And well, see, I was doing it for the greater good. I was a humanitarian. Uh, I was I was a philanthropist. No, what did you do? What is it that you did? There won't be any lying before him. It'll be the straight, unadulterated truth. You know, I planned things. I wanted to be a population control control strategist. I wanted to make sure that I had immortality. I made a pact with the devil and I made I made it my intent was to kill millions of people so that I would have immortality. I was the one who sponsored the the, the abortion clinics. I sponsored the sports leagues where I made the people use their talents to serve Lucifer to increase my profits and my powers and the souls of men. All I did throughout my whole, my whole life was wickedness. And the Most High just sit on his throne. You know what? Thank, Thank you for, for your honesty. honesty. Brimstone. Brimstone. Straight to the lake of fire. Depart from me. There's nothing else to talk about. That's how the judgment will be of those who have practiced, as Paul said, that because they practice lawlessness, that's that's what God looks at. He looks at the intent of man's heart, but he also looks at what man practiced. 
throughout his lifetime. That's what it'll be. Thank you for your honesty. Brimstone. Undoubtedly, the laws of this land are intended to put the masses under duress through stages and new levels of toxicity. As I've stated in previous videos, the fascist Marxist type of regime covertly and eventually overtly governs according to the schemes of the totalitarian tiptoe. Really, they just want to line the masses up and just force them to take the mark of the beast, but they know it will be met with much resistance. So they say, let's create a virus and propaganda to support mask wearing and social distancing. You see that? And they say, let's sit back to see how many people are stupid enough to believe a lie. Now, prior to God destroying Sodom and Gomorrah, the government became exceedingly corrupt. They made laws to afflict the poor beyond their misfortunes. And in, this, in that dispensation, anyone caught tending to the needs of the poor, they were set on fire. Uh, they, you know, they even covered a woman with honey so that bees could sting her to death. They, they released a nest of beings to sting that person to death until they swelled up and died. That's just how wicked these people were. And if a man struck a person and caused him or her to bleed, the victim would be sued in court because their blood was shed on the, the, the land. That's how corrupt they were. These people were wicked. That's why God destroyed the whole place. And this is a lesson to those of us who are not asleep but awakened to the theatrics of politicians and celebrities who are using their clout to just dupe the masses into taking a vaccine. Things are not what they appear to be. Democracy is a device of the devil shown in front of the curtain. And again, he doesn't give easy answers, especially to those who only possess faith in things that are tangible. As I always say, don't let your flesh write checks that your soul cannot cash in the afterlife. And do not get Trump trapped because they, they're using this man who's very, very, he, he's able to attract large audiences for good and bad, people who, who hate him and people who love him. He's very polarizing, just like Obama was polarizing. And the Antichrist, when he comes upon the scene, everybody will love him. That's, and that'll be a whole nother new level of deception. So we must continue in the scriptures. I know I went for a while today, but I just had to get this out. Don't get Trump trapped. Enjoy the rest of your day and God bless.